we are going to talk about sort of lifespan view of autism this morning. Uh, the way most of us have thought about autism for a long, long time now, since the really since it was first observed in the 40s, but um, since we've had a diagnostic system in the United States circa 1980 to 1985, we've really thought about autism in terms of two different dimensions. This dimension of social interaction, and we now call it social effective. It's a social effective factor on, on the gold standard assessments. But we know that there's a disturbance of the typical development of social interaction in people with autism spectrum development. We don't have to use the term disorder. If we say autism spectrum development, it's exactly the same thing. Because autism is really just a developmental path of human nature. Uh, it's a path that, for many people, uh, has very significant challenges. Uh, but we use the term disorder in order to indicate that there is a need for help in surmounting those challenges. But we could substitute development there with no loss of information. Autism syndrome development is a path that many children move along. And one aspect of that path is a very different type of social development. Another aspect of the path is this repetitive and restricted behavior dimension which is very, doesn't, it's very hard to see that early on in life, but becomes more pronounced for a period of time up through elementary school. It then recedes for many children, many adults. Um, we know that early on it's very hard to see this path unfolding. Somewhere around six months we're beginning to get hints of it. We can identify children increasingly with precision between 12 and 18 months, but perhaps not most children yet and a yet is uh, emphasized there because people are making great progress. Sally Ozanoff here is developing a new method which really may help us in that six to 12 month period of time. Um, certainly between eight and 18 months though, we can see this combination. So we have social disturbance, but if you ask any early interventionist what they're focusing on, they're saying, well, they're focusing on social relations and interaction because the child needs to be engaged with an adult. But they also focus on problems the child has in learning. If we just focus on that, we don't do as good a job as if we understand autism in terms of both of these dimensions when we're, talk when we're trying to develop interventions. We have to think about how autism affects learning and social interaction to develop the best interventions at every single age. So one of the things right now <clears throat> is when we look at school-based or school age interventions, they focus here. They almost never talk about the learning disturbance. When we talk about preschool, we're, we're very clearly talking about both. So one of the things today is I'm gonna emphasize that even after preschool, we have to talk about this and think about this as well as this. Um, as you probably all know, uh, with the um, with IDA in 1990, uh, there was a sea change in how we, the legislature, advocated for provision of education to all people with disabilities. And we won't go in, if you want to ask questions about why that happened, that's fine. But let me just say that there was a strong rationale for really beginning to move towards an inclusive model for all people served under IDEA. And you can see in 1990, um, most people under IDEA, most children, were, weren't really in regular education. They were in separate education called special ed. In the past you know, 30 years, we've begun to say special ed is not a place, it's a type of curriculum that you provide a child, and increasingly that curriculum is provided in the regular education classroom. Right? And so 60% of all children served under IDA are in regular ed, another 20% are getting the majority, 40 to 70%, 79% in regular ed. That turns out to be the case for children with autism as well. These are data from Australia, 
but um, there's something in the United States called the Longitudinal Transition Study. And the Longitudinal Transition Study allows us to know what's happening in, in schools uh, for all groups of children. Uh, it's a little slow in, in presenting the information. We have data up to 2004 for the National Longitudinal Study. And when we look at the National Longitudinal Study, we see that 80% of children who were served under this label, autism, autism spectrum disorders, 80% are in regular education classrooms by the time they're in secondary school. Um, in Australia, we can see this is, this is well before secondary school, K to two. We've got a preponderance of this group, Asperger's, and what was once called pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified in regular ed, and then 50% of the kids uh, or children with the label of autism were in regular ed about 50% of the time. Today, we don't talk about Asperger's syndrome and PDD and NOS. We talk about service levels, how intensive are the service needs of a child in school, in, at least in terms of the diagnostic and statistical manual. But today I'm just gonna use an easier term, one that's a little bit, um, uh, has greater face validity. I'm gonna talk about these children and some of these over here as children affected by higher functioning autism, okay? Most of the children with higher functioning autism and it's 68 or 69% of all children in second grade in the United States who have services under autism spectrum disorder, 69% of those children would be in this higher functioning group. I'm gonna talk about both groups. Higher functioning really splits out by how much language the child has developed basically by the time they get into school because language drives their service needs to some degree. So when we say higher functioning, we're talking about children with um, relatively typical language development and when we talk about the other group, we use the term minimally verbal children with autism. So those are the, really the two groups that schools are trying to work with. So that creates a, a big challenge for schools, right? They, um, they, want, they have to really pay attention to social interaction and social communication as a target for what they do, but that's not really what schools do. I mean, they don't have curriculums for social interaction. They don't really have curriculums for communication either. Uh, everything in a curriculum is about learning. So one of the reasons that we're beginning to pivot towards learning in the school age child is that's necessary to provide information that's useful for schools. But theoretically, it's also very important for the development of any child. <laughs> Fostering learning, the optimal learning within an individual child is the mandate of education. It makes sense that we have to figure that out for children with autism and figure out methods to foster optimize learning in individual children with autism. And that's the new frontier in terms of work from six to 18 as it applies to school, is understanding the learning problems of children with autism and providing schools and teachers with better methods to address those learning needs. Right. Um, individual differences now, th here's the complication. Schools have to do that for minimally verbal children and they have to do it for these higher functioning children. Completely different issues probably. Not completely different problems in learning, but completely different methods of approach to the problems in learning. And that's a big challenge. So we have to help schools do both of those things. And I'll give you examples of how, there's, there's actually, you know, there's a better example for how to work with minimally verbal children in terms of targeting their educational needs than there is for the higher functioning children right now. So that's, you know, I've pretty much given you the outline, but first I'm gonna talk about the, at least one major component of the learning problem that faces children, that, ch that children with autism uh, are challenged by. And then we're gonna talk about how that informs what we do with different groups of children in school. Okay, so, um, How do you describe autism? I mean, I've been working since 1981. People say, well, what is autism? And I always start stammering, well, you know, I've been studying it for a long time and I can't just 
easily give a response to that question. And it's very, very frustrating. Um, so I've begun to say that, well, you know, there are many things going on, but one of the most fundamental things about people affected by autism is that they don't easily, or as easily as most of us, adopt a common frame or common point of view with other people. Um, and that's, that's really critical, and we're gonna, I'm gonna define that in the next 20 minutes a little bit more clearly. But we can say that that's central to the social phenotype. You might hear the term phenotype from time to time. It's just a way to say the characteristic social behavior in this case. A phenotype is a characteristic element of any sort of disorder problem. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a term that I end up using because we use it in science, and then I put it up on a slide like this, and then I think, well, maybe that's not the best way to say it. Um, a common point of view is shared reference. So right now, we hopefully are engaged in shared reference. I am in, I'm kind of instructing you. I am instructing you right now. And in order to instruct you, I have to get you to pay attention to my point of view, to the information that I want to narrow your attention field to. We're engaging in shared reference. You, you can't engage in instruction unless both members or all members have a very well honed, very rapid, fluid, effortless ability to engage in shared reference, to come to a common point of view. And the struggle that you have in something like this and in a classroom is that you're not always quite coming to this common point of view. You're varying a little bit and you're struggling with it. But 80% of what I'm going to say, you're going to be able to hone in on the common point of view. We're not born with that ability. We have to develop that ability. And by and large, we couldn't develop language without first developing that capacity for a common point of view or adopting a common reference. So a lot of what happens in the first 12 to 18 months of life uh, pivots around the development of this capacity to rapidly, quickly, and accurately adopt a common point of view with other people. Um, we call this joint attention. It was given that label um, back in the 70s. We've been studying it for a long period of time. We're beginning to understand it better and better. Uh, and we know that it emerges at about at six months, five to six months of life, and that it's pivotal. If you don't develop this capacity, you struggle with language development, you struggle with symbolic development, and ultimately you struggle with social cognitive development this ability to not only adopt a common frame of reference, but understand other, how other people do that, and that they may be adopting a different frame of reference. They might try to deceive you. Their frame of reference, the information that they're giving you about their frame of reference is false. So we get into a much more sophisticated system of appreciating frame of reference as we get older, and we typically talk about that as social cognition. Okay. So in babies, this, this, the data now suggests that our brains have developed specific neural systems that support this ability domain uh, by about five months of age. And the ability domain is very simple, that you sit down with a six-month-old or an eight-month-old. This looks more like a nine-month-old, ten-month-old definitely a 10 month old. Um, and you look to the left, you look to the right, you look behind them, and some babies will follow you very, very rapidly. Other babies will stare at you and follow you after a long delay, and other babies won't follow you at all. And so we can measure individual differences in this tendency to adopt a common point of view to a location in space. And it's highly variable at six months. By eight months, nine months, 10 months, almost all babies can do this left and right task, even if they are affected by Down syndrome, if they're affected by other developmental disabilities. The group that has the biggest struggle with this seems to be, appears to be, children with autism. Um, 
And you can get very sophisticated. You can do behind trials. This actually doesn't come in. It's probably not a 10-month-old, because this doesn't really come in until 11 to 14 months of age. So you can measure this very, very precisely and, and, and see its development right through the second year. And we, I'm going to call this a responding to joint attention. The reason I call it responding to joint attention is because two very clever people at the University of Miami in the late 70s and early 80s recognized the utility of these measures, this type of observation, for working with children with complex delays, where you couldn't measure the, the kids and the Jeff Seibert and Ann Hogan worked with couldn't manipulate objects. So they couldn't even assess their cognitive development. They had to come up with a different way of doing it. So they started using these visual tasks based on theory by a guy named Jerry Bruner to assess cognitive development in young children. And it just turned out that this measure, although it was pretty good at assessing cognitive development in general, it was much better at identifying kids who were affected by autism. But there's another thing that children do, which is not simply to follow the attention of other people. Children love to get your attention and direct it to what they're interested in. Right? And so this is called initiating joint attention. So children will do something like this. You show them an object that's bouncing around out there. And then they'll spontaneously turn and look at a stranger and then come back to the object. They're sharing the experience. They're saying, it's the oh wow effect, right? Oh wow, did you see that? Well, oh wow is initiating joint attention. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a few minutes, but both of these are really incredible tools that children use in learning. This we're not so sure about in terms of its development, because it's harder to measure. The, you can't set up a situation that elicits it. You have to just watch and see what happens with children. But pretty much we're sure it's there by nine months in most children, but we don't know how early it starts to develop you. So <clears throat> there's a research group at UCLA that, that I was part of. We did a lot of work on this in the 80s. It was so clear to us that it was a strong marker of autism, and we began to present that information. And then other labs showed the same thing. And so by the, by the beginning of the 90s, we knew that this was a marker. And it got incorporated into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual so that there was this uh, item in the social dimension of autism, a spontaneous seeking to share interest, enjoyment, or achievements by a lack of showing or pointing. So let me just give you an idea of what this looks like um, in a 12 to 15 month old. I mean, isn't that a remarkably sophisticated behavior? Here's this child. Now, this is always with strangers. This actually works better with strangers than with parents. Because parents are kind of boring. Strangers, because this is a uh, affiliative behavior. The child's trying to establish contact with the stranger. And when they see something that's interesting, they want to share that. It has a strong motivational tendency, but also a cognitive component, where this child knows that that's kind of funny, and then he imitates it and kind of shares. That's almost a, a nonverbal joke from a 15-month-old, right? Um, this is a child with Down syndrome, right? So Down syndrome, a form of developmental uh, disturbance disorder um, that really is the, the Down syndrome slows down development, so these children ultimately have lower IQs, IQs in the intellectual developmental disabilities range, most often, not always. So this is a child with a developmental disturbance. He looks at me, he turns around and looks at his parents. So this isn't something that gets terribly disturbed by intellectual disability. It gets slowed down a little bit, but it comes in pretty rapidly. But here's a child with autism. And the child just never, never shares the experience. Even though this child is fully attentive to the object, this is very old. This is archival video from the data that allowed us to say that this was important. And although you can't see it anymore, this child's smiling and having a great time, very interested in the object. 
just doesn't share it. But we saw something else for kids with autism. If we put them in a situation like this, where um, the tester, and in this case it's me, reaches out and tickles the child, does the child avert their eyes? Do they not notice it and move on to something else? Actually, the child elicits it and makes eye contact. We still haven't been able to make this claim as loudly as we would like, but young children with autism process faces. They know where to look. They know what eye contact's about. If you put them in a situation that they are uh, welcome in terms of physical, social interaction, they make eye contact. There's no object to refer to. There's nothing being referred to except do it again, right? But if you put them in a situation where they could refer, share their experience, then they don't make eye contact. The eye contact disturbance and the face processing disturbance is very, very specific early on. So, uh, enough data are now available to indicate that this is part of the phenotype, that behavior, that not sharing reference as easily early on. So that when we look at the ADAS, which is what's called the gold standard diagnostic assessment, the ADAS is a sequence of structured interactions with children where testers rate the behavior of the child in the, in the interaction in, in terms of typical, uh, not so sure, or clearly atypical. And uh, for very young children with no words, these are the items. Right? And one, two, three, four, five, six of the items, and possibly seven, are really joint attention items. When children start to develop words, and they've got kind of uh, multi-word multi utterances, but not necessarily full sentences, we're still using one, two, three, four, five joint attention items. Joint attention is a major axis of the diagnostic system. Now, it gets lost in the new DSM-5, because they don't really talk about joint attention. It's on a text page behind the items where it says joint attention is an early marker. But the things that we use to really make the diagnosis rely on joint attention measures, not exclusively. There's nothing that's the answer to autism exclusively, but joint attention is a major, major component. So. <coughs> Joint attention, paying attention to what other people attend to is really fundamental. Um, and early on, there are certain basic mental processes that we developed that allow us to do this pretty well. Um, we have to do it fairly often in infancy in order to practice and develop the mental processes and the neuro, neural circuits that allow for this to happen. For some reason, this is less likely to go smoothly for infants, in, uh, for infants with autism in early development. So we say it's, there's a vulnerability. We don't say joint attention causes autism. We say autism is part of, and we say joint attention is part of the vulnerability in the development of children with autism. Some children with autism, you can have autism and have good joint attention. Um, you can have poor joint attention and not have autism. Blind in people have poor joint attention, right? They're not going to use visual modality. Um, but in overall, there's a strong connection between this vulnerability and, and autism. This is why joint attention is so important. So, for example, Simon Baron Cohen would say it's important because it allows us to think about other people's minds, which it does eventually. But more importantly, early on, it allows the child to participate in learning in a way that's very, it's fundamental. So most of you have had experience with children. How do they develop language in the first two to three years? Do you all have little classrooms in your house and you sit them down and say it's, it's language learning time? <laughs> good, that's good. So now we can move on from that idea to the notion that kids are very active in learning. They're very active learners. They have to be able to organize information to boost their ability to take in the learning opportunities that you're providing 
kind of mindlessly. I'm not, that's not a, you're, it's called incidental learning. You're constantly providing babies with learning opportunities, but they've got to organize the information to benefit, to derive the most benefit from them. And the classic example, this goes back to the 90s, Dare Baldwin, she did a whole bunch of studies and illustrated it beautifully this way. She was in England, so um, she's talking about a parent here who's out walking their child in the pram, you'd call this a pram, right? Um, and the, the parent provides a learning opportunity. Oh, look at the cheeky rooster, right? The child, though, let's, let's say I'm the child in the pram, and actually the parent's walking me through this hallway, and they say, oh, look at the beautiful painting. Well, what, how am I going to know what the heck the beautiful painting is? Are you the beautiful painting? I'd have no idea, because my parent's not taking me right to it and saying, here's the beautiful painting. They're just noting it. So the only way I can begin to figure out what my parent's trying to tell me is to look at my parent's direction of gaze. And if I see they're looking over there, I know that no one here is the painting. And something over there is the painting. The biggest thing over there is that. So I'm more likely to associate painting with that object. The child has to use the gaze or join attention to organize the information to be more likely to map the word onto the right referent. They have to engage in shared reference, right? OK. So what happens when a child does this? Or a child goes, comes toddling towards you, going like this, showing you something, right? Well, they've really organized the information or the learning opportunity then, because then you're going to say, oh, that's a bottle, a bottle of water, a bottle. And, and the reference is already established by the child. And the parent can easily follow the child's reference because they're initiating joint attention. So when the child initiates joint attention, they open themselves up to a very clear learning opportunity. So initiating, in some ways, is even more powerful than responding. So given that, <coughs> There must be a connection between joint attention and language. And boy, there was, there's so much written about the connection between joint attention and language. But most often, it's correlations. A child with a lot of joint attention does a little bit better at language development later than a child with less joint attention. But, but Connie Cassery, right here, and I were both postdocs at UCLA, and we were doing the joint attention work. And Connie um, is a really, really good educational psychologist. And she took on the challenge of saying, OK, well, if the theory is that joint attention allows children to learn language, and joint attention is disturbed in kids with autism, and that's leading to a learning problem, then if we target joint attention, it should impact that learning problem. They should be able to learn better in, in any situation. So what she did, and has done a lot of now, is she developed a means for intervening with this behavior so that she could really foster the tendency for children with autism to show and point to things that they were interested in. And the way she tested this was really an interesting way. She um, looked at different groups of children um, who were all getting applied behavior analytic intervention for 30 hours a week. So they were all in ABA 30 hours a week. And she gave one group of those children a booster of joint attention intervention, right? which ended up being about 30 hours over a year. So basically, it was 1,500 hours of ABA with an additional 30 hours of joint attention booster. And the children with the booster right here, did much, much better compared to a booster of symbolic play or just the ABA alone, particularly those children that had no language when they came into the study. So this is experimental evidence that we think there's a connection between joint attention and learning. We think there's a connection between joint attention and the problems in learning language in autism. And we go in and we experimentally affect joint attention in children with autism, and they learn language better. And Connie's published, oh, about, I'd say, six or seven randomized control trials showing that this 
effect is real. So it's a targeted intervention that helps children with autism learn better in another type of intervention, which is exactly what we think we need to do. We need to identify the learning mechanisms that are inhibiting children, target those, and they will learn better in most other situations. Okay. The other thing that's pretty important about joint attention is that we're very social. Most of us are very, very social. Children with autism are actually more social than people, I think, give them credit for. And that most of us learn more deeply when we are actually attending to something with someone else. So oftentimes, that's mediated by language, because we're both looking at something in there. Um, you exchange information about it. But there's a lot of studies now that if you just have people looking at the same picture or the same narrative, they encode that information better if they're aware somebody else is looking uh, at that. Many children go on to show these basic joint attention skills by the time they're in school age. But recent research is beginning to indicate that when, they, when you do put kids with autism in a situation where they're able to look at something and learn about it by themselves or with somebody else, they're not benefiting as much from that at additional attention of someone else. And that begins to help us understand something about the learning mechanisms in the classroom. Because classrooms are designed in part to help us learn by learning together. And that might not be happening as well for children with autism. It doesn't mean they should be out of the classroom. It means we need to understand that problem and see if we can somehow change it a little bit. That's early stuff. That's just a little side note, actually, for what we really want to talk about today. So <clears throat> after age five, um, school becomes the most common and longest term venue for intervention for all children with autism. Right? It's, it's the place where we can have the biggest possible impact on the development of autism. Five to seven hours per day from kindergarten through 12th grade or longer. Right? So we have to start thinking about, is there still a learning problem for even for the kids who look like they're doing well? Uh, and what's the learning problem for those kids? What's the learning problem for the kids who are minimally verbal by the time they get into uh, kindergarten and first grade, and how do we address those learning problems? Very, very few studies on that. Very, very few. It's a missed opportunity. Um, but this paper just recently came out, 2014. And it came out in, a, in this journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, and a very famous woman uh, at the University of Boston, her name is Helen Tager Flussberg, who's been working in autism for a long time, wrote an editorial that appears at the beginning of the journal. And she says, this is singularly the most important paper that's come out in the last 30 years in how to work with minimally verbal children after the age of six. Because it's the only thing that's been shown to really have an impact. And in the way this study was done, it tells us a lot, a lot about the learning uh, issues that might be a challenge for minimally verbal children in school. Again, this is Connie's work, but it's based on joint attention theory. It's based on the use of something that she now calls JASPER, which is joint attention, symbolic play, engagement, regulation, intervention. Who wants to say that? Right, so that you just say JASPER. Um, and also something, she used that combined with enhanced milieu teaching. I'm going to show you what this means in just a second. But enhanced milieu teaching is just to help teachers recognize communicative bids of mi minimally verbal children. They're usually nonverbal. And to be able to respond to those more frequently, more consistently, more positively. So this is you know, basically teaching teachers to observe a little bit more closely. This is actually teaching teachers to go in there and try to change those joint attention behaviors. And then she had another group who received both of these plus speech generating devices. Do you all know what speech generating devices are? OK. So <clears throat> back in the ooh, 80s, maybe even the 70s, something called picture exchange communication was developed. And picture exchange communication is very useful for minimally verbal children. So 
Picture exchange allows children to learn that a picture signifies something. A bottle of water, you hold it up in class, the teacher comes by and says, oh, you need a water break? Okay, let's go get some water. Uh, um, a pencil, you hold up a pencil, the teacher sees it and says, oh, you don't have a pencil? Okay, here, I'll give you a pencil. So children learn to use pictures to communicate rather than words. And um, it, it really helps children make requests, at least, to request things. But it also had an interesting effect. It seemed that when children started to, minimally verbal children started to use picture exchange, they actually started to talk a little bit more, to start using words a little bit more. But that effect was never big enough for it to be the root to increasing language use in children with autism. It used to be pieces of paper. Now it's an iPad or a specific tablet, a tablet, tablet, uh, by Dynavox, and there's a couple other brands too, but you, can, you get the idea. There's a variety of pictures that you can program. You can change them with age for children. They can point to them, and now they don't even have to show the teacher because the tablet voices the request or voices the word. And now you can even have things like, that was fun. Um, so you can go beyond requesting. They're much, much better, much more sophisticated, much more flexible. So again, Connie presented children, had the 61 kids, um, and they're going into school, and teachers are implementing this, and they either get this naturalistic intervention for joint attention and uh, teaching teachers to be more responsive to nonverbal bids, or they get all three. And so in this particular, increasingly, you don't want to have a group of kids. If you think these are going to work, it's unethical to have a group of kids consigned to not getting the treatment. So now we tend to try to give everybody a treatment and just compare them. Eh, not the best graph, but we're going to work our way through this. So when we just look at joint attention plus the EMT, the increasing the responsiveness among teachers, and we look at the total utterances, and these are functionally com communicative verbalizations. More of them are words, but they might be wow or something like that. Um, you can see that there's steady progress right through the intervention phase. Kids are increasing with Jasper, and then they continue to increase for 24 months afterwards. Right? So the Jasper and the EMT had a, had a pretty good effect. The kids went from 30 utterances in a, about a five minute period of time to you know, somewhere around 48 utterances, a good effect. But look at the effect when you combine it with the speech generating device. First of all, it's, it accelerates. The kids in that first year do much better. It's almost uh, 20, 30 percent better. So when you combine uh, working on uh, interventions that affect the child's understanding of reference, and then you give them a referential augmentative device, the two combine so that they really get into communication. Now the problem, not a problem, but the, the slide is saying, while this continues to increase, they've learned to learn. Once you stop this, um, stop the support for it, the training of it, kids begin to fall off. And it, you really have to maintain the training with this in order for this to be effective. But it's the combination of the three that looks like it's going to be the best way to approach minimally verbal children. And if this is true and you maintained it, it might have a truly significant impact, not on all minimally verbal children, but enough minimally verbal children that it will be worthwhile to implement in schools. And now they're going on to try to uh, show that that is the case or is not the case. So as I said, we actually have moved from understanding one component of the learning problem of very young children to implementing it in preschool children and showing that it has an impact, and now in implementing it with minimally verbal children in school and showing it has an impact. We want to use that same model for the higher functioning children, understand what their learning problems may or may not be, and then design interventions to target those specifically. The problem here is, as you, as you grow, as you develop, um, it, 
it becomes more complicated. There are a lot of changes and differences. And so with the higher functioning kids, trying to figure out what the learning issues are is a little bit more complicated. There's not the obvious target of language. And in fact, we tend to disregard language in high functioning children because compared to the minimally functioning children, they look like they have no language problems at all. So we, for the most of us, that creates a little bit of a, a perceptual problem. We can't see that language might still be a problem for these high functioning kids. One thing we know is that there's a lot of learning disabilities. We've started to study these. Um, I'm going to talk about reading, what we know about reading development in these children. Um, I was going to point out that this is the person whose data, who's, who's really co um, coordinated the reading studies in the lab, but I don't need to do that because she's sitting right there. So Nancy, you're going to have to stand up now. This is Nancy McIntyre. Um, and I'm now going to talk about Nancy's work pretty much. Before that, though, um, you know, one of the things that we're curious about is how to teach. So, so higher functioning children with autism, um, you know, they don't fit the mold of most people's stereotype of autism. They may seem idiosyncratic. But for teachers, their behavior often looks like another group of children who are affected by attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And those of you in the schools know that, that that's a tough one. I mean, they, that both groups of children don't seem to be paying attention in the classroom as well as they might. Um, and it's really hard to say, well, this child's not paying attention because of autism, and this child's not paying attention because of, of ADHD, because they can just look so similar. So one of the things that we try to do in the lab is say, OK, well, you know, baseline, we've got to understand the learning differences between high-functioning children with autism and children with ADHD. Now, people haven't been doing that. and People are increasingly doing that. But certainly, that's something that's come into the science in the last 10 years at maximum. So we just don't know a lot about this. So one of the things we've tried to do, although it's hard, is to, is to request time from teachers. They're very, very busy to give us their perception of what the differences are between ADHD children and children with autism in the classroom. This is a very small sample study. I'm just going to use it as an example of, of what we would like to do more of in the future. We use this measure called the SSIS, which is the Social Skills Intervention System. Very good measure, because it has teachers give you information on <laughs> communication, cooperation, assertion, responsibility, and a variety of other domains that could be helpful. We were surprised to see something, a small study, but teachers didn't see big differences in communication or cooperation or, or assertion. Where they saw the difference was on engagement. That makes sense, but we thought they'd see differences elsewhere as well. It's a pretty narrow difference. So what's engagement? Well, engagement on this task, on this measure, is how well the child engages in cooperative, or do they initiate cooperative activities? Do they join with cooperative activities? And when you think about what a cooperative activity is, it's children paying attention to the same thing and working on it together. Fundamentally, joint attention and joint reference is built right in here. Uh, it's, it, the reason ch children in classrooms with autism may not engage in engagement as much as ADHD children is not clear. It could be motivational. It could be cognitive. But it does bring us back to this construct of doing things, paying attention to the same thing with peers, and engaging in activities with it. That seems to be the big the most obvious thing to teachers. What's not obvious to teachers, and this is a little counterintuitive, is when we ask teachers about social and ac uh, academic competence, not social, academic competence, they rate children with autism as higher than children with ADHD. They say, oh, they're competent, more competent. They're not saying they're competent. They're saying they're more competent. Right? But when we ask parents, the same parents of the same, not the same parents, the parents of the same children, <laughs> um, they don't give us any difference in their awareness of the learning problems of the child. They both say, oh, yeah, they have learning problems. <laughs> so for some reason, teachers and parents 
see the child slightly different relative to an ADHD sample. The teachers see them as doing perhaps better than, uh, than the reality would, would warrant. Um, and one reason might be is that many children with autism early on in school look like they can read pretty well because they're pretty good with um, word reading. Some of them, I have to be very careful. Now Nancy's, she may just jump up and say no. She might shout no at some point if I get any of this information slightly off because she's much better informed. But for the most part, there's, there are more children than one would expect uh, who really do very well with word level reading. And word level reading can be very impressive. Um, but it might also be confusing teachers as to the real academic ability of children. Also, they're pretty good with facts, too, which can be very impressive. A while ago, 2010, a group of people at Yale said, you know what? You know what's really interesting? If we look at what's going on in reading comprehension um, for kids, difficulty understanding or visualizing causal sequences, difficulty with planning, difficulty with integrating words into a whole meaningful unit, difficulty following reference. If we look at what's, what you need to do to read well and what goes wrong with poor readers, wow, it looks a lot like the core deficits of autism. There's an overlap between what you have to do in reading and what some of the vulnerabilities, the cognitive vulnerabilities in autism are. And when, we th when Nancy thinks about reading, I never thought about reading this way until Nancy told me to think this way, but you really want to think there's a very simple model that says reading is dependent upon how well you can decode words, and then your higher order language, inferences, your ability to uh, understand meaning across a longer narrative, things like that. And then there's probably these other things. Um, but we basically studied a lot about this in terms of reading issues for children with autism and a little bit about this so far. Um, and we wanted to understand how many kids have problems with reading comprehension? When does it de develop? In elementary school, in high school? Is it because of word reading problems? We don't think so, but nobody's really tested that well enough. Or is it because of higher order cognitive or language-based problems? Um, so we got a grant from the IES. Uh, I don't think there's anything else like this in the country right now where we're following a large sample of children longitudinally through elementary and high school and trying to understand the development of reading, math, writing, and, and uh, oral language, uh, basically. And we, have, we, we break the autism sample up, the kids with autism, we break them up into those with ADHD symptoms and those without, and I'll explain that in a second. Then we also have a group of children who have symptoms of ADHD, so we can understand their reading development. And then we have a group of kids who we would say aren't affected by either of these or any other issue that we're aware of. Sometimes they end up being called a typically developing sample. Um, one of the things that you can see is that these are pretty uh, bright children, 101 IQ, 100, 101. And then we draw the typical sample from Davis, and that cants it a little bit to the higher end. So that's a little bit of a problem in these data. Um, so how do we rate ADHD symptoms? ADHD is best rated by, not by the child, but by an observer, either a teacher, the parents, or sometimes even uh, um, in, a, in a structured format by a pediatrician or a child psychiatrist. But most often it's parent or teacher report. And we use this thing called the Connors, which is 57, 58 uh, questions. And parents rate their children on, they sh my child never shows this. They show it sometimes, or they show it all the time. And we get these scores um, on inattention and hyperactivity. Um, and the thing to understand here that an average score is 50. Um, and so when we look at the children with typical development, they're right around 50. On inattentive, they're right around 50. On hyperactive, impulsive. When we look at the children with ADHD, they're much higher, 70, 77, 72. Um, and only about 5% uh, of children would be this, 
at this level. Even less, this is probably closer to 2% here and 2% here. But look at these combined children, the children with autism and ADHD. They're at 80. That's about the 99th percentile. There's very few kids that are going to score up there. And that's the mean of that group. Um, and then the children with uh, autism but without this, they're, they're kind of lower. They're in, in terms of hyperactivity and impulsivity, they're, they're average. So there's two different groups of children, high-functioning children with autism in the classroom. One group, and it looks like the majority in this sample, ha are also showing a lot of attention problems. And then another group, not so much. That's news. I don't think that, that was news to me. I don't, I didn't, there's no other information like this. But that's going to become important for educators and parents. This, I'm not going to go over. We measure, I'll just tell you that this thing called the ADOS, I showed it to you before, it's the gold standard. So we measure uh, the clinical samples, clinical groups on that. So if you're above seven, that's qualifying. That means you meet criteria for autism. These children are a little bit higher. Nancy, when I, <laughs> when I, you know, I, I wrote the grant and I was ready to go and, and Nancy joined the lab about six months before we started or something like that. And so I wanted to measure reading with the Wyatt. It's just two measures, really, basically. Um, and I thought, wow, that's great, standardized. Everybody else is using that. And Nancy said, well, I don't, I don't think that's adequate because we wouldn't know anything about decoding, really, not enough. We wouldn't really know about reading comprehension because the way the Wyatt measures reading comprehension is inadequate. So I said, OK, well, you tell me. And so this is Nancy's battery. And it's the most comprehensive battery, I think, that's ever been presented to children with autism in school to measure reading development. Uh, it really gets at a number of different dimensions. All I, just putting this up to, say that it's a really comprehensive look. And it allows us to do a lot of kind of nuanced things. The main finding so far, one of the main findings so far, is when we look at younger children, so we have elementary school children, 8 to 11, and then we have basically secondary students, 12 to 16. When we look at the younger children with autism, we see they're about you know, 1 in 1.6, 1.4, sorry, uh, grade level behind in reading comprehension. That's significant. The children with ADHD, less so. I mean, there's a big difference here in the reading development in, the ele in elementary school, and the typical kids are just about at uh, average. If we then go forward to these older children, my goodness, they're, they're further behind. So we were just talking about the idea of deceleration. And before, the, before the, I began to talk, I was talking about the notion of deceleration in development. Oftentimes, with these children with autism, they don't keep up. It's not like they're losing skills. It's just that the other groups are going ahead faster. And that's what's happening and looks like what's happening in terms of reading comprehension here. They're not keeping up here, and then they fall even further behind here by uh, secondary school. Kids with ADHD show the same effect, but not nearly as robust or strong an effect. And the kids, part of the reason these kids look like they're falling behind more is the kids in secondary school go accelerate forward. At least many of them do. Okay. Um, but that's a significant issue then. So we've identified a learning area. One learning area for high-functioning children with autism is in reading comprehension. About, I'd say, five to seven other papers were available before we had these data that were strongly suggestive of this. But they didn't quite capture it like this. They didn't capture the age differences so clearly. The sample size weren't so large. They didn't control for ADHD. So this is kind of the definitive data right now saying, yeah, this is a real issue for higher functioning children, some higher functioning children. Um, we can look at fluency, too. How well can children read out loud? How, how rapidly without making errors? We didn't see too much of an impact of ADHD on reading within the autism sample. It didn't matter if they were high or low on ADHD in terms of how they were doing in reading, which was a surprise to us. Um, it does matter a little bit in terms of fluency um, in that, 
uh, they're a little bit lower, see Gort fluency here, they're a little bit lower if they have the symptoms of ADHD than other children with autism and a little bit lower than the other samples as well. So the one thing that marks this group in terms of reading or stands out is that when they're trying to say things out loud, that's a struggle for them when they're reading. So reading, there are many, many things children have to do with regard to reading, and we can't get to them all in one study. We can look at a few things like reasoning, and this is a, um, an illustration that Nancy found that I think is really uh, compelling. I mean, this is what reading's like. It's all these different strands that have to intertwine perfectly together in order for you to have a strong rope or a strong capacity for reading comprehension. And if any of those strands are weak, you'll have some weakness in reading comprehension. And the more strands that are weak, the more weakness you'll have. Uh, so we can look at one of these strands right now, verbal reasoning, the ability to, to make references, because you have to infer things when you're reading or listening to language. And one of the measures that Nancy put in is a um, curriculum-based measure called the QRI. Which, which measures reading comprehension, but it does it in a different way than the GORT does. And it does a couple things. It uses explicit questions. Do you know the facts? Uh, didn't I put an example? Yeah. The boys were walking home with shopping bags full of food. Uh, where were the boys walking? Right? They were walking home. That's a fact. Right? Versus an inf implicit message, where were the boys walking from? They were carrying shopping bags. You wouldn't say they were walking from shopping bags, right? <laughs> well, you could, but you would probably say they were walking from the store, right? Or you could say they were walking from shopping, which is almost there, but you have to make an inference. So that's the difference. And you can see that the, so we've got the, uh, the high-functioning autism, high-functioning with ADHD. You know, here, they're not doing too badly, they, they are lower, but they're not doing as, they're not as far off with the explicit as uh, one might think. And the great thing is we can, this is tested without the child being able to see the text that they were just reading. And then we give them the text. They can look back at the text and we see if it improves their response. And everybody improves. So it's malleable. This problem that they're having with reading is one in terms of keeping it as a representation and accessing it. But if we give them the information, they can see it. It's not a problem with picking it out of the text. So that gives us hope and entree into how we might begin to intervene. When we come over here to the implicit, that's where the problem really is. They're much lower on implicit. Even here, though, they improve. <coughs> but they stay much lower on implicit because that's a core cognitive issue for kids with autism. Making inferences, we don't understand why, is a little bit more difficult for them. You know, in order to continue with this kind of research, uh, and I think it's very, very important, we have to be very, very sophisticated in how we try to interpret the information. Um, and so one of the things that Nancy's done is gone way beyond my sophistication in terms of the data analysis. And so we can now interpret all of the kinds of measures that we're using to see exactly what's driving the, the reading comprehension problems of the kids with ASD. And basically, you know, I'm presenting you this so you can see that it's hard to tell you everything because it's really complex information. Um, but what we really know is that these types of language measures where we're looking at higher level language processes really are driving this relationship to some, to some degree. And particularly um, when we, we look at the connection between symptoms, autism symptoms and the problem, we see that the symptoms surprisingly are related to reading accuracy. I think we have a we understand that's not that important or not that informative. But the symptoms of autism are related to language, which then are related to reading comprehension. Seems obvious, right? But for the most part in our field, when kids are, get to the, you know, they're high functioning and they're in regular education, we don't think they have a language problem. We don't intervene with a language problem. We say they're doing so much better than the minimally, minimally verbal children 
that that's no longer an issue. But it is an issue because it's directly connected to reading and learning from reading. So we have to understand this much better, and we probably are going to have to figure out ways to identify children who need the extra intervention on language development in order to get to better reading comprehension. So what Nancy's, the next step that Nancy's taken is she's developed groups. She's actually been able to group these kids into the ones with the worst reading uh, comprehension and better reading comprehension and begun to identify the characteristics of the kids with the lowest reading comprehension versus the highest reading comprehension so that we will be able to go into classrooms and say, oh, this child is at risk in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and we probably need to bolster their curriculum around language and particularly oral language comprehension and reading comprehension in order to hold off the problems that might be coming down the road. One of the things that we can see, and you don't, this is a scatter plot, and the, the thing to really pay attention to here is this line. And this line tells us that in terms of high functioning children with autism, that there's a relationship between their reading abilities and how well they do on math problem solving, word problems. If, you, if you're not reading very well, you're going to get to a point in other areas of learning in school that the reading is going to start to impact and negatively impact your ability to learn. And this is just evidence that reading in our sample is related to their ability to solve word problems, math word problems, which is a big, big issue. You've got to be able to read to be able to do some aspects of math. And we have um, also started to look at writing in students. This is a really tough area. I mean, this is really hard. How many teachers or educators are there here? So what do you think about the writing development of students with autism? <laughs> I see wide eyes like, oh, let's not talk about that. So, you know, if, when we ask parents, you know, what are the problems the higher functioning children are having? They say reading and writing, right? And they say math too, but reading and writing always. And so we've really got to put our minds to understanding what's going on there. We've started to look at the writing. Measurement of writing is much harder than measurement of reading or math. Um, all, what we've done so far is just begun to understand that working memory really seems to be something that's very, is a big component of the ability to write and looks like it might be driving some of the issues for children with autism. In fact, when we, when we look at it more closely, basically, that when we look at children with autism, age, symbolic working memory, and story memory affect writing, whereas for the ADHD sample, story memory, but it's something else, not working uh, verbal, uh, symbolic working memory. And then um, in the TD sample, neither working memory or age were re related to writing. So we can begin to tease out the things that are related to the writing problems, and we hope that in the future that's going to really direct us to, okay, what do we need to do for this group of kids? What do we need to do for that group of kids, et cetera? But the writing is going to take us longer than anything because it's the measurement issues. We've got um, Matt Zajac from University of Santa Barbara. He's a graduate student. He's very clever. He's tireless. He's working all the time on it. And the progress is very good, but very slow in developing really accurate uh, writing measures. OK. So one of the other things, though, that's important in all this is that the way you think about it is, OK, you identify problems. You try to uh, identify the learning mechanisms. I started out by saying that reference and the difficulty with reference was kind of pivotal for people with autism. And then I ended up saying, or we have, that looks like reading comprehension is kind of a problem for many individuals with autism, the higher functioning individuals. Uh, it's clearer for them. So can you connect up reference and reading in children with autism? Possibly. So here's a study that was conducted um, in 2004 
there just aren't very many studies of reading intervention for school-aged children with autism. I mean, there's, actually, there's no high-quality studies of reading intervention for school-aged children with autism yet. This group decided to say, well, you know, maybe we'll use strategies. We'll tell children to pay attention and think. You, gotta, you can't just go to reading passively, right? We've all done that. We sit down to read a book we're really interested in, but we're not fully intentional. Maybe we've been dis distracted, and we sit down, and we read a page, and we haven't read the page. We've actually read the page. We ha our eyes have gone back and forth over it, but we didn't have the intention to read, and therefore we didn't read. Well, that could be part of the problem for kids with autism. They don't engage in the intention to read because it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't trigger as naturally for them, right? Uh, asking questions. Well, one way, if, you're, if any of us are reading something complex, we have to go back and check constantly that we understand something. What, what does phenotype mean again? I've got to go back and redefine that and get that so that I know what, how it's being used in this sentence. Right? So you have to ask yourself questions, or better yet, do this in a group and have each other asking questions. Right? Or you can just practice with pronouns. Now, how many of you knew that was called anaphoric cueing? Yeah. <laughs> so now you have something that you can impress people with. Um, so anaphoric cueing, you can just get kids to really understand the relationship between he in a sentence and which character he is referring to, she in a sentence, and which character that's referring to. Right? So in this particular um, study, they worked with 20 students. And they found that anaphoric cueing was singly the best thing they could do in brief interventions um, in order to increase uh, reading. Now, this, isn't, this, isn't a, this is a great study in that it gives us an idea of what to do. It's not a good study in saying, oh, we now know that anaphoric cueing works for kids with autism. It doesn't tell us that. It just says, hey, somebody else, look at this, because we've got a small signal here that this might be the thing to look at. So the other thing that um, defining these learning mechanisms help us do is they say, OK, well, if reference is really important in autism, and it might lead to learning or contribute to learning problems. And one thing that we can see in older people is their ability to handle anaphoric cueing or pronouns. That's, that, that's kind of referential thinking, and it might be a problem for people with autism. Well, maybe we can start looking at the brain mechanisms for linguistically-based reference. Uh, this is sometimes um, called diexis or diectic uh, studies, and it's the study of referring in language. Right? And in this study from Nancy Minshew, who is a long standing, very good autism researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, who's really been leading the way in some ways in understanding complex learning and information processing in higher functioning children with autism. She and her group did a study on diectic shifting uh, and perspective taking in higher functioning children, not children, adults with autism. So how do you measure that? Well. First thing is you have to come up with something simple, because this is going to be done in a um, functional imaging platform or a magnet. So in a magnet, basically, you're on your back, and you've gone into this big plastic tunnel, and it's going to measure brain activity. And you can't move your head around too much, and you have to stay there for about 40 minutes. Um, so what they did was they developed this task. They would show people a picture, um, and I forget whose name this is. We'll call her Sally. So this is Sally, and she's and the, you know whoever's going to be watching this has a name. We'll say that's Bob. So Sally says, "Look, I have two objects here, and if I fold it, if I fold this in half, you, Bob, can see the carrot, and I, Sally, can see the house." Right. So you set up the understanding that you're going to have different perspectives. You're, you're going to show the person in the magnet this, and then in the next 
time they'll have this, and you'll ask questions. What does Sally see? What does Bob see? Or you can take it to, what do I see, and what do you see? So that comparison there between what does Sally see and what does Bob see versus what do I see and what do you see is called a dialectic shift. You're using a vaguer reference, right? You're using the pronoun as the reference. And so you can measure the cognitive processes around pronoun processing that way. And what they found was, you know, when um, what is called fixed here was the use of the proper name, Sally and Bob, there wasn't much of a difference at all. A little bit. This is latency. How fast did the individuals give a response? Um, and it was relatively fast for both of them. However, when there was a shift to the pronoun use, it was longer for the autism group. The individuals affected by autism took longer to give the response you see the carrot, I see the house, right? Then for the controls. When we see it's longer, we assume a couple things. We assume, A, they can do it because they've done it, right? But longer means more effort. It was harder. They had to really take a little bit, a few seconds, I can't even say a few microseconds, milliseconds longer to process it. When we see that something is involving a longer duration on the milliseconds, we assume now that that means areas of the brain weren't working together as fast or efficiently as they were in the other group. So this suggests that here there's some sort of connectivity issue, areas of the brain working together not as rapidly as here. And when they went into the imaging analyses, they found that this area uh, in the, way back in the brain, it's called the parietal cortex, and this area way in the front bottom of the brain called the insular cortex really had to work together in order for people to quickly give responses to pronouns, and they weren't working together as quickly or as efficiently in people with autism, and that was causing it to be more, or not causing it, that is a marker of it being more effortful in people with autism than in the typical group. So we can actually take this construct of reference, measure it in infants, see how it's useful in terms of early intervention, understand how it's related to learning, begin to push it up into the school age, begin to study reading as, a ki as involving reference, and also then take it into imaging studies to begin to understand some of the neural underpinnings of this learning mechanism involved in reference. And so this is, this is typical now in autism research, that we no longer kind of stay in our, our little area. We try to push it across the lifespan and across disciplines so that we can get a clearer and clearer picture over time. That's something that happens especially here at the Mind Institute, but it's happening in a number of centers throughout the country. So I hope this gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're trying to do in terms of really targeting learning and understanding it well enough in school-age children to begin to develop better interventions and then ultimately deliver them in ways that are useful. That's a hard thing. In ways that are useful for teachers. Thank you very much. Oh. One last thing. One of the things that we are on the cusp of developing is a reading center at UC Davis once we understand a little bit more about this, we hope to be able to begin trying out interventions for children with ASD that will impact their reading in efficient fashions. And if we find that they do, then we'll start working with schools to implement them in schools. I have Asperger's syndrome, as you probably know by now. Unless I'm an adult, at least I look like one. Uh, I'm a visual learner. I learn, uh, this, is for, this is really for adults with autism, but don't get much help. Maybe this will help them. I learn very little from lectures. So when I go to class, like I took calculus, and I couldn't learn anything. But the professor would write equations on the board and erase them. So what the heck good did that did? This was back in the 1980s. So anyway, make a long story short, I once took a higher division probability class, and I couldn't understand the professor, who did not have a of course who did not have a PhD. Anyway, I could not understand the text either. So I finally learned the material from another text and read the book and studied the book and did the problems, and I got a B. So I just want to make a comment about that. Yeah, absolutely. And now, luckily,
people don't erase things from the boards because we tend to put things up forever on the web and students can right. look at them over and over again. I am a grandmother and respite care worker for my, uh, my granddaughter who's autistic. She's, um, <clears throat> I'd say, fairly high functioning. But one thing that uh, has really um, fascinated me about her is that she, <clears throat> she expresses a, such a higher level of empathy than my neurotypical <laughs> grandchildren or my own children. And I wonder if you'd care to comment on that because it, uh, it confuses me. It's, it's wonderful, but. Yeah, so I mean, I can't, I can't comment specifically on your granddaughter, but so, so one of the things about something like autism is um, that it is highly variable in how people display it. And, and that's partly because people are very different. And there are some people who are high empathy people, uh, and there are some people who are low empathy people without autism, thinking about that, right? So you can well imagine sometimes that autism occurs in a person that's moderate empathy or lower empathy. And autism probably has some impact on empathy. And for those people, the combination of low intrinsic empathy and autism together really move a person to being a relatively low empathy. But you can have autism occur in somebody who is intrinsically high empathy too. And so what does it look like there? Well, it can actually look like that person, the empathy remains even though the autism is expressed, and we get individuals with autism who have higher empathy. Most often it seems to be the other way, but it's not without precedent for having higher empathy people with autism because we, it's very confusing. Things that co-occur a lot with autism we think are part of autism, but that might not be the case. There might just be a group of things that co-occur that aren't really part of it, and empathy might be one of those things. I mean, certainly in the, for one thing, children with autism uh, are attached to their caregivers. Um, and we began studying that at UCLA. So then we started to do, to you, to do empathy studies, um, where a, a tester would bang their hand and would the child rush over or look at their face and what we found was, you know, most of the kids with autism didn't do that, but 40% did. 40% did look and look back and express some concern. So the study came out and said children with autism have an empathy impairment, but if you actually look at the data, there were individual differences there, and there are always individual differences like that. There's always some people with autism that show high empathy. There's always the same thing with face processing, same thing with joint attention. It's very confusing. Okay. Is it a very thin line, or a very thin line of difference between high-functioning autism and ADHD? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the things that we see, that the hyperactive impulsive is not part of it, uh, but when it's inattentive, that can be very confusing. So here's, this isn't um, something that there's a lot of evidence for yet, but the way that we might be, begin to think about it. For children with ADHD, they are inattentive in the following causal sequence. They uh, can follow the direction to pay attention to something. However, they are at risk for losing uh, the, the, the goal of paying attention, and their mind starts to wander, and their attention starts to wander. And then their working memory hasn't held that goal, so there's nothing to trigger, come back to your goal, get back over here. So once they are distracted and lose attention, they lose it for a longer period or more robustly than typical kids do. Children with autism may appear attentive because you give them a direction to pay attention to something and they've never picked up on that direction. They haven't followed your reference in the first place. So they might look like they're looking at the book but they're really not paying attention to it and so they just move then off to something else but they don't even have the goal of paying attention perhaps. So it's not the same process but it looks exactly the same to teachers. So we're not sure about that, but that's a reasonable surmise at this point. Okay, these are two related questions. Uh, one is, what would you say is the most important take home message for parents and teachers from your research in terms of classroom interventions? And 
the related question is how do you help high functioning children with high functioning autism who are behind in reading and if we're and if we're cueing or other interventions. I'm so no, based on what you know now, what, what would you say is let's, the take let's home message? Let's go with the second part first, and I'm gonna ask Nancy to talk a little bit about how we might intervene with kids with autism who are having problem with reading comprehension. Then we'll come back to, you know, what do you, how do you interact with schools and teachers, et cetera. So as far as reading intervention goes, I wanna back up a little bit to the subgroup slide that didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> but what we've learned about our sample of 81 children with, that are highly verbal um, is that there, about half of the sample actually has underlying language impairment that seems to be quite subtle until you start to measure it <laughs> with my huge battery of measures. Um, so we looked at syntactic development, we looked at morphological development, vocabulary, and phonological processing, so that's kind of what we call structural language. And about half of the sample actually had subtle structural, or even not so subtle, structural language problems. Not to mention then there were some higher order things that Dr. Mundy referenced, like the inference measure, we had a narrative recall measure, and we had a sentence processing measure. And all, the majority of the sample had difficulty with some aspects of those higher order processes. So the reason I'm kind of throwing all this at you is you, kinda, you need to really look individually at the children and understand a lot about their language development in, up to that point, whether they're eight or 16 or 18, to understand the reading problem. So once you have a little bit more understanding about the language, both the structural and the higher order, um, then you can start to think more about, well, what is the comprehension intervention for this child? So it's... <laughs> What we're doing in the clinic is we're, we're piloting Dr. Solari's intervention that she'll talk more about this summer. And it's a very targeted oral language intervention for reading comprehension. And she, she builds upon skills that start with, first of all, just engaging with the text as it's written in the book. So that's kind of like what you saw on that slide with the explicit versus implicit question type. So how do I know that something happened because it was right there in the book, you know, and, and so then that's the first skill is just, do you understand what, what was written? And then you start building on that and until you got all the way up into very explicitly guiding the children, how do you make an inference? You know, what kinds of things do you already know that you're going to bring to this text to integrate with what's written so that you can make greater sense of it at a deeper level? So I'm, I think that, unfortunately, there's not a one-size-fits-all intervention, and I think that the anaphoric cueing is a very interesting um, hint at other kinds of things that we can work on with the kids that are helping with higher-order processing. So I hope that's so and, on and, it. and I think it, that informs you about interacting with schools about this. I mean, really, the researchers have not provided the schools yet with what they need to do in order to help children with autism in first grade through uh, 12th grade. I mean, we just haven't done that. We haven't focused on it. What we do understand, though, is that schools can get fooled. A parent may say, gosh, my child's just not picking things up with reading, but the schools may not be picking that up because the child's actually extracting facts pretty well, but they're not making inferences, or they're reading words pretty well, but they're not reading for, for content. And so the thing to do is to ask the schools a set of questions. Do you have a reading specialist? Do you have the ability to assess my child for reading comprehension problems? And if so, the schools can, you'd really want to encourage that for any child that you suspect is having a reading problem. If not, you would ask the schools, do you have any or would you recommend any tutorial services for schools? And can you help me afford it if you can't afford it? And see if you can go outside the school to get extra help for reading for students. Um, and then if the answer is no, no, no there, then I think you, if you can afford it or get something to help you afford it, even consider the reading programs that are out there because 
The problem with the reading programs that are out there is that they're not, they're not research-based, so we don't know how well they work with different children. But if it's possible to expose a child to more practice, guided practice in reading, you should be able to, ter to determine within a four to six week period whether the child is actually responding and, and beginning to pick up on reading better. And those are the options right now. Our hope is that the curriculums, there's a, there's a in California, um, uh, it's very, very likely that teachers are going to have to receive better training, or are gonna be mandated to get better training for their credentials in working with different groups of kids with disabilities, which is perfect for us, because we hope to be developing the interventions and then move that right into teacher training in order to have the greatest possible impact. Because it's not just the intervention development, it's providing the information, the information to schools effectively. I'd like to just add to the school team, another person to consider is the speech and language pathologists in the districts, because I think they could potentially have a, a strong role to play working with a reading uh, specialist and a classroom teacher. Yeah. Or just on the language basis. Yeah. So this question is, are there any studies on homeschooling? Are there learning studies at the mind of UC Davis um, that we could enroll in as parents who are homeschooling their children? You know, I, I, it would be hard to rule it out, but I, I doubt that there's any high quality study on homeschooling and its effects on children with autism simply because there's so few studies of education after the preschool period. Uh, in terms of enrollment here, we hope that the reading center is uh, open to parents, I would say at the earliest by this fall and by the latest by next spring. Um, and that's the goal is to fit this, exactly this sort of thing, not just for homeschooling, but for any parent to have a resource so that we can both learn and provide services, and as we learn and provide services, know better how to do that, to, how to bring that into the classrooms. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.